And hi, everyone, and welcome to, welcome to the, today's Institute seminar. Today, um, we have Kai Trepte with us. He's a postdoctoral researcher currently working at the Stanford National Accelerator Laboratory. Um, he has a physics background and did his PhD in theoretical chemistry at TU Dresden. And his research is mostly concerned with methodological <laughs> developments in density functional theory, especially with respect to improving the accuracy of DFT calculations and overcoming systematic errors um, of the approximations therein. But today he's going to focus more um, on the educational side of DFT with the next DFT project that's, that aims to um, reduce the entry barrier for people trying to understand the theory and the simulation methods. And with that, this, uh, I hand over to you, Kai. Take it away. Yeah, thank you so much, Lenz. And uh, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm very happy to uh, be able to speak to you today uh, with our next DFT project. Also, my collaborator Sebastian is here, so that's great. So thanks for coming. Right, so I'm just going to share my screen. Maybe you just could let me know very briefly whether you can see my screen. Anyone? I can see it fine. OK, thank you. <laughs> All right. So hi, everyone. As introduced, my name is Kai. And I would like to talk to you about our next DFT idea, which is concerned with DF DFT implementations and the current limitations, especially with respect to um, education. This entire project has been started by uh, Sebastian, who uh, initialized the entire idea, and who also currently has a student working on that idea uh, explicitly. His name is Vanya. And I'm going to show some results later on where uh, we started to introduce these ideas into actual codes. But first of all, I'd like to give you some sort of uh, background what the next DFT idea is all about. Um, there is already a GitLab repository uh, made by Sebastian, which more or less summarizes the current status and the current ideas. But what I would like to do is just to guide you through our thinking process and um, where we think we're at and uh, where we want to be with this next DFT idea. Now, very briefly, uh, in order to uh, start on the same basis here with everyone. What we are doing is we are trying to um, approach quantum mechanics from a computational point of view. And this is where we introduce density functional theory, also called DFT. Now, typically in quantum mechanics, for an n-particle system, the Schrodinger equation is a partial differential equation in three n dimensions which we typically write down as h psi equals e psi, which means the Hamiltonian acting on the wave function and gives you back the, the energy. Now, the Schrodinger equation in general is way too complex to solve. So we need approximations to solve this equation. And this is where Cohen-Sham DFT comes into play, which is an approximative way to solve this equation. And instead of having uh, the dependence on the wave function itself, what DFT does is to express the energy of the system, which is capital E, as a function of the density small n. So we reduce the complexity of the problem from three n dimensions to three dimensions, given that the density itself is just three dimensional. So the entire energy is comprised of a kinetic energy term of the electrons, we have the interaction of the electrons with the nuclei. We have the Coulomb interaction between the electrons. And we have an additional term called the exchange correlation functional, which compensate or is trying to compensate all the approximations that go into the other terms. So this is like this universal approximation that um, we're trying to make as good as possible to get the best possible predictions. So DFT fundamentally is exact if we were to know the exact form of the exchange correlation function, and we don't. So with that come certain problems in DFT calculations. And this is where uh, the so-called self-interaction corrections come into play. 
so as I just said, one needs uh, to have an approximation for the exchange correlation functional. And due to the fact that this is an approximation, it is not exact anymore. What is happening in DFT is that electrons are described to interact with themselves, which is unphysical. I think we can all agree on that. And this is called the self-interaction. Now, back in the early 80s, Purdue and Zunger proposed a way to compensate the self-interaction error um, by describing that the exchange correlation energy and the, the Coulomb energy of every single electron would have to, to cancel, would have to compensate. So what they did is to essentially extend the cone sham energy functional with a self-interaction corrected term, which for every electron in your system subtracts this self-interaction error and you end up with a corrected energy functional still based on the, on the density and on the single electron densities. So this just a brief you know, outline into what is DFT and what we're we dealing with and extensions of DFT that um, I'm also gonna talk about a little bit. So this is the basic theoretical background. So what we're trying to do is to get these equations into a code. And now before I start talking about next DFT altogether, uh, I want to do some, some disclaimers here. What we are trying to do with this next DFT idea, um, the first thing that uh, is not the focus right now, right now in the current status of the project, is we're not aiming for the most efficient code ever. Um, we're also not really focusing on speed optimization right now. Because uh, as you all know, there is uh, parallelization schemes like MPI and OpenMP. There are different ways to optimize different problems for even for different basis sets. So you can uh, think about that if you have a local basis or a plane wave basis, you would uh, write down specific parts of your code differently to optimize it differently. And all of these kind of optimization schemes are not really the main focus right now and for what I'm, what I'm going to show. The next thing that we want to make very clear is that we're not trying to compete with anyone. We are not competing with existing codes. You know, existing codes are there for a good reason, and that is because they work and they are efficient in everything. So we're not trying to replace any existing codes. I think existing codes are very good and are very useful for the community. Um, what we are also not trying to do, and this is kind of sort of the one of the main points of this next CFT idea, is to try and not use a very high level, very abstract way of coding um, and having these abstract coding language pragmas or, or metaphors in order to speed up the code. So optimization should not be done at the cost of code readability. And that's really the, the key for us from, from our perspective is that uh, there are great codes out there, but the readability is sometimes a little limited due to all the optimizations that went into the code. So what we are trying to achieve is codes that um, are easy to understand for even for a student and um, are not uh, too complex to understand. So this just, again, as a disclaimer, we're just trying to uh, make something that is, that is educational and useful for the future. Now, in order to address the general problem we're trying to, to, to encounter here is that there are some sort of language gaps if you go into the field of DFT and even into, into self-interaction corrections. And that is, you have the different perspectives. You have the theory side, and the theory side um, is something that will be taught by a professor in uh, a lecture. And um, it could be a chemist, it could be a physicist. Uh, and what they do typically is use some sort of abstract language, which is not directly uh, codable. So you can't use 
the language that you see in the lecture and put it one-to-one -one into your code. So there's kind of sort of a, a difficulty. Um, and also the way things are taught, there are many flavors, slangs, there's jargon, which all makes it more complicated for students to really grasp what the theory is really all about. And uh, the other side is the coding side, which typically when coding is taught, um, it's not necessarily taught in the best possible way. That is, you have abstract coding problems that you're then trying to solve, but there isn't really any relation to content that was taught in, in your theory class. So it's, it's not really straightforward to connect the coding side and the theory side. And in order to summarize that, I'm gonna uh, go over here to the right-hand side. What we typically have is um, the expert side, which is your professor, your, your coder, you know, whoever is in charge. And you have the non-expert side. And the non-expert side is what we are trying to focus on. And these are the students. Now the expert, um, what the experts are gonna do is to teach the theory that is, for example, quantum mechanics or, or what, what not um, in, in a rather abstract way. And this is then communicated, you know, it could be typeset in LaTeX, doc, whatever, PowerPoint, um, is, and is then given to the student, to the non-expert. So we have the theory side that is taught in, in one way. And then the non-expert has to try and uh, learn um, this, this theory side. And this is all fine, this is all good. But now at some point after the expert taught the content, uh, they might say to the non-expert, okay, how about you are now going to use code A and compute the energy of the hydrogen atom? You know, very simple example. Um, but once the non-expert is asked that, so this is the level one here, calculate just something, um, there is the first, there's a first language gap. And this language gap comes into play when the non-expert tries to use um, any given code that the expert wants them to use. So you're starting to um, encounter compilation, right? Which for some codes is rather easy, for some codes is not as easy. You have dependencies and all of these kind of things that um, are never really talked about, are never really taught, especially in, in the coding, in, the, in, in teaching coding. So there's already some hurdle um, that the non-expert has to overcome in order to be able to just solve this rather simple task of you know, calculating the energy of the hydrogen atom. But students are you know, typically able to, to achieve that, so to overcome this first hurdle. And now that they did that, the expert might come and say, well, how about you now take this code and put something in there that isn't there yet. For our uh, intents and purposes, right? You have a DFT code and you want to introduce seven action corrections. Now what happens to the student is they're starting to go really deep into what has been coded and uh, encounters different coding languages, right? From potentially from what they from what they learned could be Fortran, could be C plus plus, could be you know any programming language and any kind of programming style. So what the student now has to do is to try and read the code and then translate what is written in the code to what is actually um, written down from a theory point of view. So there is this this disconnect or this language gap between really what is written down and taught from a theory perspective and what is actually written down in a code. And um, if this code is, is written down in a way that is hard to read from a non-expert point of view, it becomes very difficult for this non-expert to uh, start these new developments to implement something new because first of all they gotta understand you know what is actually going on in this code right now before you can extend it so students can encounter 
these uh, language gaps, which leads to um, a slow knowledge gain, slow education, um, which could be avoided. There's also the code development in of itself, which is slowed down simply by the fact that um, a given code might be somewhat hard to read for a non-expert. And another potential problem with that is if a developer of, of a code uh, leaves and nobody takes care of the code anymore, uh, the code can't really be used because uh, nobody's able to, to really um, see uh, what's going on, like how the code actually works. And then you're pretty much uh, forced to either write a new code or, or get a different one because this code is, is not, not as um, easy to use, especially from the non-expert point of view. So that's kind of sort of the, the general problem that we are seeing in, in the educational aspect of uh, coding of DFT and is something that we would like to, to address. Now, um, in our little community, we, we asked a few people that we are working with and we asked them some different questions of what makes a good code, what makes a good DFT code and even um, an SIC code, but you know, the general answers are, are um, applicable to DFT as well. So we asked, you know, what kind of electronic structure code do you typically use? What programming language do you use? Um, what kind of installation style do you want? And, and you know, every um, possible question regarding um, what kind of code and how uh, easy or difficult it has to be to use. And all of us unanimously agreed that um, a good code has to be easy to install and easy to use, and it should have um, as, as little dependencies as possible. Because the fewer dependencies you have, the easier it is to install. So ideally you have, you know, fundamentally no dependencies if you can, but the fewer the better. And also in general, a good code needs to have uh, some sort of either shell or Python-like user front end that makes it very easy to set up calculations in a very user-friendly way, which uh, is something that, that a good code should simply have. So at least the possibility to write down uh, shell scripts or Python scripts. Then um, there was some sort of diversity in the answers of you know, what a good code should uh, put out in terms of output. So some people are just interested, for example, in the total energy. Other people are interested in the total density, which is pretty um, fundamental in DFT. Then other people are interested in the forces acting on the atoms. So there's very little output and there can also be a lot of output. So there has to be the full user control of what a code puts out. And uh, this control has to be um, given to the user. Also, a good code needs to be easy to adjust. That is, if, for example, you're trying to add a new basis set, which describes, um, fundamentally, in the end, describes the quality of your density. Uh, things like that should be, should be easy to include into the code basis without having to rewrite the, the entire core structure. So what this all leads to is that a good code needs to have a human readable code basis. So when some non-expert comes to start reading the code and it's written in a way that um, is either adapted from, from the theory language, from the plain abstract theory language, or just in a way that is very clearly human readable from top to bottom, it is, of course, much, much easier for this non-expert to read the code, to understand the code, and then also to be able to extend the code uh, with a new feature. So this point here is um, one of the really important things that um, this entire next DFT is, is really about, that we get a code basis that is actually human readable. Also, from these questions that we had, again, in our very small community, um, is that different people like 
you know, different kinds of calculations, say like different kinds of, of basis sets of methods of even of flavors of DFT. So what a good code needs is to offer a certain variety of different uh, flavors of DFT, or again, should it should be able to easily include new flavors of DFT into an existing code basis. Now there's also most certainly, and for good reasons, uh, people who like uh, older coding languages, somewhat older coding languages, or more established coding languages, like uh, Fortran and C++. Um, and with that, a good code, again, if it's human readable, uh, should also be able to be transferable between different coding languages, such that different experts in different coding languages can work on the same problem in the same way. So that's, I think, the, the base summary of um, what, what we think, from our perspective, um, a good code, a good DFT code should have. Now, what I want to show you next is, um, are essentially two things. First of all, I would like to show you this, this web interface, which, um, so what this does, what, what this entire thing here does is, that we have a web server which um, translates the information that I'm putting into this window here to um, my my local computer, my laptop, um, where what I can do in this presentation mode is to execute an electronic structure calculation, a DFT calculation, um, while still being in this presentation mode. So it's it's a very easy setup for complex workflows to be able to uh, run complex calculations in a presentation. So this is, you know, point number one, that this is a, a very neat way to, to include um, calculations into your presentation. And the other thing that I would like to show you today is um, this. And what this is, is the input for a DFT calculation based on the so-called PySCF code. Now, PySCF is a code which, you know, as a front end at the very least, is mainly written in Python. The deep core functions are then written in C++. Um, and the way PySCF works, and this is the entire DFT calculations that you see here, is we build ourselves um, an object, but it is, you know, if you go back to the Schrodinger equation, you could think of this as, as your wave function. So we set up um, a calculation of the hydrogen atom, which sits at the origin. We uh, introduce a basis set, which again describes more or less roughly the quality of your calculation. In this case, it's a somewhat good CCPVD set basis. So it's a local basis set. And then we introduce, you know, that the hydrogen atom has a spin of one. So it has a single unpaired electron. And in the next line, we introduce the approximation to the exchange correlation function that I introduced in the very beginning. Here we just use uh, the LDA PW. And in the very end, all we do is to execute this calculation. And all I can do right now is to click send this command and this command is then sent to my local laptop where the calculation is actually carried out and then the result is transferred back to me and then onto the screen right here which is uh, this and this is just simply the total energy that we are getting out so what this is supposed to show this pi cf example is already a very, very good starting point for what um, at least the front end, the, the user end of the code should look like. It is very simple. We have four lines of code effectively, because this is just a comment line. And uh, it already does the full DFT calculation uh, from top to bottom um, with just this little, little kind of input. So you could say, that PySCF is, is pretty much already what we are trying to have, right? It's a very simple way 
to, to adapt to different uh, calculations. It's a very easy way to carry them out. But one of the problems, at least for us, is that in the deep core of PySCF, uh, things are not as simple anymore. For example, you can think about um, if you would like to introduce Elena Jones uh, potential, Elena Jones force suite, for example, where you can write down everything pretty easily. You know, you have your energy, you have your forces and whatnot. Um, and then you go into the core of PyCF. And this is what I'm showing right now is um, the, uh, the core routine for uh, the so-called co-iterative augmented Hessian. And I, I'm just gonna go through that very briefly. And then um, I think you will already agree that um, from just having a very brief look on this, um, you might not be able, especially as a non-expert, to really realize what is actually going on here, uh, what, is, what is being done. Um, and it, it is definitely not as easy to really understand what this routine does, first of all. And uh, yeah, second of all, how to adjust anything in here to make it do something else. And this is still, you know, the, the Python interface. This is not even the, the C core routine. So one of the one of the, the good things about PyCF is the front end for sure. And uh, everything is is mainly written in, in Python. But once you want to go a little bit deeper and you want to start including you know, new features and things like that, um, even in a code like this, you will face certain problems in that the core routines and everything uh, are still written in a way that are not really understood or not as easy to understand at the very least, um, are not as human readable as we would like them to be. And so um, even PySCF is, is a good start, but is still not right where we wanna, where we wanna be with the next DFT idea. Now, can we go? Yes, okay. So um, in order to more or less summarize the, the progress we would, like to, we would like to make with the next DFT idea um, is summarized in, these, in this ladder plot. Um, so from our perspective, um, you can uh, arrange different codes and uh, uh, different ways of coding in some sort of an electronic structure code ladder. And what we feel like is that the lowest rungs, what, what they have in common essentially, is that uh, there is missing uh, documentation or it's very outdated. Um, to get the code to run in of itself can be sometimes very difficult if you um, are able to do it at all. They can be pretty hard to use. And uh, the, the one goal we would like to have here is to extend these codes is more or less impossible if you're not an expert in this code uh, in of itself. So there are you know, ways to, to code these kind of things, um, which was definitely done in the past and is still being done by, by experts in um, somewhat uh, more established coding languages like Fortran and C++. What has then been introduced um, in in the more in more recent codes, is the usage of certain libraries. You know, you have, for example, the libxc, which introduces many different exchange correlation functionals that you can then use in your DFT calculation. We then um, go a little bit further to this this blue line here, and that's called the DFT plus plus. And I would like to talk about that um, a little bit more. And I'm going to talk about that uh, in the next few slides as well. DFT plus plus has been introduced in around 2000 by Professor Thomas Arias, and is a way to write down a code in the exact same way that it's written down on the blackboard. So um, Professor Arias introduced um, an operator-like way of writing down equations in a code that allows 
for uh, the straightforward translation between uh, my equations on the Blackboard and my equations in my code. And so this is something that you know goes very much is very much in line with uh, with our next DFT idea, which makes it much easier for students to really realize, okay, this equation I saw in the lecture, and now this equation is exactly here in the code, so I know exactly what it does. Um, so we we continue upwards for you know in in terms of coding languages, what is uh, nowadays a little more established, like Python, and even nowadays more so. Uh, or coming is Julia, where there are already some established codes that are written in this programming language. And where we want to go with that is to really take all the advantages that come from all these lowest rungs to the higher rungs, combining them all, combining all the experts in those fields, and uh, generating something that um, allows, first of all, for something that increases development speed, which again, if you have this human readable basis, it's going to be very easier. It has to be educational. This is one of the one of the points we're trying to make here. Um, so we can give this task to students and they are able to do it within a reasonable amount of time. And of course, everything we do, this goes beyond this, but anyway, uh, is going to be open source and open science because we strongly believe in the ideas of uh, open source and open science, which in the end is uh, most important for an idea like this to combine uh, all the advantages that are already there into something that um, is going to be useful in the future. So that for the base summary of of the next DFT idea. What I would like to mention is that it's 2021. So 40 years ago, um, John Perdue and Alex Zunger came up with the uh, self and action correction scheme I mentioned in the very beginning. And given that it has been 40 years, what we are proposing is a coding challenge. And I'm not going to go through the entire thing. I'm just going to outline very briefly what this coding challenge is all about. What we're trying to end up in is um, a very user-friendly and easy to adjust DFT code, which also includes this more advanced feature of SIC. And we would like everyone who is interested um, to uh, code a DFT plus SIC code that could be written in any programming language they want. It uh, can use any, any pragma that you feel like is the most useful and the most understandable. Um, what you shouldn't do is uh, assume knowledge from you know physics, chemistry, installation kind of thing. So it should all be um, aimed for, for students. So um, you should have a code that could be uh, recomputed or recoded by a student within the time of, of a lecture or less. And the entire idea about this, this coding challenge is really to, to get together all the expertises um, of all the experts that are out there um, and to summarize all of the different ways you can code a DFT code into something that is the, the best possible and the most understandable way to write a DFT code that can be done by a student. And with that, students would have the chance to um, write their own DFT code with easily within a lecture and having a more fundamental understanding of what DFT is. And then of course, you can uh, give these students a more established code that they can then use, but uh, are more able to understand what is behind um, so what is behind what the code is doing. Right. So, uh, in terms of you know who we are trying to address with um, this this project, it's mainly students, as as I mentioned a few times. Um, it it should be something that is very educational. 
it's of course also for PhD students, for programmers, whoever is interested in, in new and modern ways that allow for um, an easy way to code a complex problem like DFT um, in a way that is the most understandable um, and most easy to use for uh, non-experts. Um, so if you want to enhance your coding skills and also the theoretic understanding of DFT itself, then um, this would be something for you to do. And of course, uh, we are not saying, okay, you have one month, you have to code the best possible DFT code, including SIC and whatnot. So we're not putting pressure on anyone. You know, it should be, it should be educational, but that it should be fun because otherwise you're not really learning anything. Um, and if you want to understand the inner workings of DFT better, then essentially what we're saying is you're definitely not alone. Like we have a small community so far and uh, wouldn't mind extending that. And we are uh, always happy to, to share, to um, discuss and to um, approach a common goal in terms of uh, a better, a better, more fundamental understanding of DFT, especially from the student perspective. Okay, now, of course, one question, if, you know, I tell you, okay, start writing a DFT code, um, how do I start? Like, what do I do first? What do I do second? Um, and where do I go from this? So what, what we are doing and what we think is, is a meaningful way of doing things is first of all, you got to select um, the most meaningful DFT programming pragmas that you feel are most important. Um, I already mentioned the DFT++ and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. There's also the so-called FFR and I'm also going to talk about that on the next slide as well. So you got to... Uh, think for yourself, you know, what's the best possible way to write down my theoretical equations into a code such that they are easy to understand, that they work, and um, that they are not too slow. Um, then the next stage would be to uh, code prototype codes uh, in different programming languages. Um, you can do this yourself, you can do this in groups, uh, your students can do that, such that we have a variety of different codes based on different coding languages and different perspectives, um, and then trying to combine all of those into um, one final uh, code that is potentially, hopefully, the most user-friendly and the most easy to adjust code, um, which would then be followed by an official announcement of you know, this is how we wanna how we wanna do things uh, in the future. So, in order to go into a little more detail about the stage one, the DFT pragmas, um, let me introduce uh, three different ways of of doing this. So, there is the so-called DFT plus plus, and you know, I mentioned that a few times. There's also um, there are papers out there describing this new algebraic formulation of DFT, which was done by, by Thomas Arias. And the way this works is that um, the, um, the DFT++ pragmas are using an operator-like uh, scheme similar to the operators we saw in quantum mechanics, again, like your H psi equals E psi, um, in the exact same way you can uh, write down the code. And this has been really done in um, the, this DFT++ pragma. And one code that actually um, does this is the so-called JDFTX, which is written in C++. And it's something that uh, I'm going to talk about in a second. You also have um, the FFR, which is based on the name of the, of the programmer who has written uh, several DFT codes already with, um, you know, different bases in different programming languages. And uh, these pragmas can actually be somewhat formulated in pretty much the same way as DFT++. 
An example code would be uh, the PWDFT, which is written in Julia. And from our perspective, from our side, um, we would like to combine the efforts of DFV++ and DFFR. And this has been done in the so-called plain DFT code, which is uh, written in Python, um, which has been written by Sebastian's student, Banya. Um, which uh, also introduced you know, extended details like uh, different basis sets and things like that into a code that is um, about as, as simple as it's going to get, we think, written by a student within you know, less than a month. In order to show that you, know, you, can, you can code a lot, but of course, you got to make sure that uh, the outcome is not unreasonable. What I want to show you on the right hand side is a little comparison between the three different codes I just mentioned. And up top, we have uh, the difference in the total energy in Hartree energy units. Um, the energy scale here is in terms of 10 to negative 5. So, as you can see, for the little test set we're having here, which consists of uh, some atoms and some very small molecules, um, the energy differences, and we use JDFTX as a reference here are tiny. They are, you know, at most in the order of five times ten to negative five. But besides that, it's it's below micro heart rate, um, accuracy. Again, in terms of of the JDFTX reference, so um, we get the same energies out. And um, in terms of the SCF step or time step, so the time per SCF step, uh, we can also compare these codes. And we see that um, even this plain DFT code is not unreasonably slow. It is actually pretty comparable to the other codes. And again, we didn't shoot for the most efficient code here, but we were shooting for something that is not unreasonably slow, but still gives a very reasonable um, answers, results, uh, in terms of the total energy in this case. So in order to show you that, and in order to show you how this, how this actually works, this plain DFT code, I'm going to give you another example in this web style interface. And uh, this is, sorry about that. So this is the input file, similar to the ones we have seen uh, for PySCF for this plain DFT code. Now, um, all that happens here is that from this plain DFT, we import all its functionalities. Again, the author is Vanya Schulze, which is a student of Sebastian. And all we do here is to set up our atoms object, which is just the hydrogen atom, which um, in a more abstract way, you can think of as your, your wave function in the Schrodinger equation right, h psi equals e psi. So this is your psi. And then this SCF can be seen as an operator, your, your Hamiltonian, your h in your Schrodinger equation, which acts on your wave function. And what you're going to get out is, right, you have h psi equals e psi. So all it does, we have uh, an operator acting on our wave function. And what we're going to get out is the total energy, which is exactly given down here. So this is really the way that, that we're trying to do things. Um, it's very easy to use. As you can see, this is three lines of code to calculate um, the total energy of our hydrogen atom. And uh, is written down in a way that corresponds to the theory language of um, operators in that you know an operator acts on let's say your wave function and you get out your your total energy and again this has been written by by a student within i want to say less than a month and i guess sebastian can correct me on that right now this is basically all I wanted to, to talk about today. What I want to say is that um, we, as a community, we are active on Twitter under the so-called OpenSIC uh, tag. 
um, on Twitter and as well as on ResearchGate. We are uh, posting updates on the current research that we are doing. We will um, show you if we publish something new. And also we have a YouTube channel uh, on which we are providing um, a, the, the latest research we are doing and summarizing, you know, summarizing the research we are actually doing to a broader community, um, given that YouTube is freely available to everyone. And uh, yeah, we are, you know, doing some YouTube videos uh, to explain the deeper details of uh, our current research to be able for everyone to be able to see what we're actually doing. So with that, I uh, would like, first of all, all of you for your attention. I would like again to thank Sebastian for setting up this project and also making this presentation for that matter. So uh, thank you very much. And thanks to Vanya, who um, has been a little bit of our guinea pig in this, uh, in this context to code his own DFT code within um, a very short amount of time, which is more or less a proof of concept that this kind of approach, this next DFT approach can actually work. And with that, I would like to stop and um, I'd be happy to answer any of your questions.